Good evening, everyone. Erev Tov. I'm Rabbi Barry Schwartz, the head of the Jewish Publication Society, and I welcome you to the JPS Skirball uh, Author Series. This is the second year of our wonderful collaboration, and I'd like to thank Temple Emanuel and the Skirball Center. Last year, we were fortunate to bring seven of our authors, representing seven new books, uh, to discussions here at Temple Emanuel. And it looks like for this 2014, 2015, we'll also be bringing, uh, hosting seven events, the first of which is this evening. Besides the Temple Emanuel Skirball Center brochure, make sure on your way out if you don't have our new fall supplement for uh, JPS books. JPS recently celebrated its 125th year as the oldest Jewish publisher in the United States. We have been a mission-driven, educational um, organization since our inception. And uh, we're, very, we're very fortunate to continue on with our uh, commentaries, illuminating the Bible, the Talmud, and other classic texts in Jewish tradition. We're uh, delighted uh, this evening to welcome to the JPS Skirball series, Jerry Rabo. And he's come all the way from Los Angeles, where he lives, for this, uh, for this presentation via Toronto. And he told me that when he spoke at Holy Blossom in Toronto, a congregation uh, like Temple Emmanuel, that the people were listening, they were extremely polite, but they were altogether too quiet. So Jerry would would appreciate this evening if you speak up, if you ask questions, if you challenge. He's a lawyer by training, so he can handle the challenges. Uh, Jerry, as I uh, reiterated to him, is not in the typical profile of a JPS author. He is not a rabbi, and he is not an academic in Judaic studies. Nevertheless, when I first saw his manuscript, I said, this is a serious student of, of Judaism. And it turns out, when you have dinner with the speaker beforehand, you learn all kinds of interesting things. It turns out that uh, Jerry dropped out of Hebrew school, Hebrew high school. Now, it's not because he wasn't interested in the subject. The Hebrew high school, or so he claims, was not serious enough. Uh, but Jerry, after a very successful career as a lawyer in tax and real estate law, was able to retire about 18 years ago and pursue serious study of Judaism with the distinguished rabbi of his congregation, Valley Bet Shalom, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, whose name you may have heard, and to continue to study at some of the many opportunities in Los Angeles universities. One of the topics he became interested in was the lost matriarch, if you will, Leah. I was discussing this new book that we're delighted to publish with some members of my own a congregation where I lead Torah study on Shabbat morning, and one member of the congregation, a woman, said to me, I'm really glad that this book has been published because she said, Leah doesn't get a fair shake in the Bible. And perhaps the rabbis, as we'll uh, hear in a moment, uh, we're aware of this. And then another woman piped in I'm really glad that this book was published too because when you stop and think about it, Leah is the mother of us all. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, well, she had the children, the first four children that included Judah, and we are Judahites, Jews. And so when you stop and think about it, she is our mother. The opportunity to extend and reclaim the legacy of a biblical matriarch 
is one that we think is important and we hope that this book will find its way into adult education, into uh, Bible studies in synagogues throughout the country. This evening, Jerry will begin with a, about a 10 minute uh, overview. We will have about a 30 minute text study and then a wrap up. Once again, thank you for participating in the JPS Skirball series, and I'm very honored to present our teacher, Jerry Rabel. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, yes, we're always learning. I finally heard why in the world Barry was enthusiastic enough about my book to say they'll publish it because I'm not sure I would have because you people will never see what Barry saw, which is the first draft. I am so ashamed of that first draft. It, um, it benefited, however, by a superb editorial staff, Carol Hupping in particular at JPS, um, and, and uh, the editorial people uh, at uh, University of Nebraska Press. So uh, I'm really pleased that you're going to be looking at, I hope, uh, the final version and not that first version that Barry signed on to. Um, Barry is a rabbi and I think it's wonderful that he has demonstrated what I wish every American rabbi would demonstrate that he lives by faith, because for him to take on this book from, as he put, as he put it, um, as diplomatically, uh, by someone who doesn't usually grace the, the JPS uh, schedule of books coming out, um, took, uh, took a, a really great leap of faith, and um, uh, I hope all of this won't disappoint him. And of course, he got me here to this magnificent, magnificent institution. And we started out with a little private showing uh, of, the, of the sanctuary and uh, it's wonderful, and hearing something of the history. That's really wonderful. Um, but one thing I guess I should say from the beginning is there's been a little bit of um, um, misunderstanding uh, in the materials that went out and the things that you've heard. Because we are going to be doing this uh, lavender sheet, quite appropriate by the way, lavender sheet um, uh, study session, but I'm not going to be the one who's studying. Uh, you are, and I hope you are going to be the ones to come up with answers. Uh, because what I'm trying to accomplish in the book and what I'm trying to accomplish tonight is, is, has nothing to do with theology. I'd like you, I'm not against theology. Some of my best friends are rabbis. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the Hebrew Bible can be read in lots of different ways. Theological, certainly. Historical, although I always put quotes around that because Bible history isn't quite history. Um, uh, we read it with reverence, as is very appropriate. Uh, it informs our daily life, which is very appropriate. But m the point I'm trying to make is that it is also great literature and can be approached as great literature. And I think the key to, to uh, the Bible, which needs no defense from this attorney, the key uh, to the Bible is that when was it that Jews decided that they will, they will read classic literature and discuss it intelligently? They'll be in book clubs and read contemporary literature and discuss that intelligently? But when it comes to the Torah, to the Bible, they, that's sort of off limits. They, they become consumers and not participants. I think that's a huge mistake. And I frankly think it cannot sustain itself. It will drive this holy book into a relic, uh, which is not the status it deserves. So 
I come to you with a lot of baggage, with a lot of agenda, with a lot of goals. And my goal is, um, uh, my goal is to see if you will acknowledge uh, after tonight, or certainly after reading the book, that this is, the Torah is a, a book that, that you can participate in just as you participate in discussions or thinking about challenging books. Uh, I must tell you that um, uh, I try to keep up. I, I tend to be a nonfiction reader, but I feel an obligation to read some fiction. And I don't think I have understood a Man Booker Prize winner in four years. I mean, it just, I don't know what all that is. So I'm not saying that I'm an expert in anything in this field. But I think, frankly, it's a lot easier here. And we'll talk about why. So I think it's, I think it's full of paradox. I think that one of the reasons why the why the Bible is so difficult to read is that we get taught Bible stories, in quotes, bodlerized, simplified, uh, Grimm's fairy tale level stories out of the Bible uh, when we're very young from authority figures. And uh, sooner or later, we understand about Santa Claus, we understand about the tooth fairy, and we understand that those stories just don't make any sense. And that's it. We're done with that book. We're going to move on to Shakespeare or, or Dostoevsky or whatever is you moved on to. So I'm, this is a call for you to come back. Um, and let's talk about what happened. Um, what happened is that I wasn't I have to admit, the first person who had this thought for thousands, literally thousands of years, 2,000 years, say, um, the rabbis have been reading, and that's the beauty of Torah, have been reading the same Torah, the same book, and, but, but, but not as children. They've been reading it as, as adults, as sincerely religious individuals, and they came to the conclusion that for it to make sense, they have to read in a different way. Uh, the, the, the classical term for that is midrash, and some of you may be familiar with that genre. Uh, but it's nothing to be afraid of. It is what I consider deep reading, deep reading. So you don't, I don't really care about your personal views about Torah. You may believe that it is God-written, or at least God-inspired. You may believe that every word is holy. Um, that's fine. And if you don't believe that, that's also fine. But, but read it as a book in which every word is important. And in fact, read it as a book written by, by some very clever author or authors who do not make everything easy for us. So let's, um, let's go on and see what, what we can learn from all this. Um, I guess one of the first questions you have a right to ask is uh, why Leah and, and uh, uh, Rabbi Schwartz certainly indicated um, experience that he's had from people. Uh, I'll share with you, because I'm out of town, so nobody knows who I'm talking about. I'll share with you what determined me to do this uh, at a time when I was just toying with the idea of turning my personal interest in uncovering Leah's story into a book. I was invited, uh, Lola and I, my wife and I, were invited to a, a, um, a, a dinner uh, given by friends, and I was seated at the hostess's uh, left hand, and so we were talking, and she asked what I was doing. This was a woman who, who is a pillar of our congregation, who has attended services and uh, Torah discussion and whatever for 40 years at that time, just as I have, and, she, and I told her I was sort of intrigued with Leah. 
And she said something I will never forget. This intelligent woman who is in a book club, um, this intelligent woman who's been exposed to Judaism, she said, was that the good sister or the bad sister? And I realized how Leah had gotten uh, excluded. Not from the book itself, because there's not much about her in the book to begin with, but she's gotten lost to us, to Judaism in general, um, from our affection, from our remembrance, and from our understanding. So I, I do want to do the the um, I do want to do the study from the study sheets. Uh, it is no coincidence that the topic uh, for the study sheet is what really happened on Leah's wedding night. And that is because uh, this is not the first uh, uh, nonfiction Jewish book I've written. And uh, my wife Lola, when she found out to her dismay that I was not going to return to household tasks anywhere uh, soon, and she would continue to be the one changing light bulbs because I had this new idea. And she said, okay, I can't talk you out of writing another Jewish book, but do me one favor. Do something that will help, help it sell. She said, all the successful authors put some sex right in the middle. Do that. <laughs> So, right in the middle of my book is a chapter called What Really Happened on Leah's Wedding Night. And that's what we're going to be approaching tonight. But first, I want to make sure everybody is up to speed. We have to deal with, again, in quotes, history, biblical history. The Bible, one of the things that makes the Bible difficult to read is you can't just open it at chapter 27 or 28 or 29 and start reading because the Bible doesn't work that way. Uh, the Bible is based on a philosophy that God works in history uh, by rewarding and punishing actions through that person sometimes, an immediate reward or punishment, but sometimes generations later. That doesn't feel like divine justice to us, but uh, that, that is the way the Bible is uh, apparently written and certainly is the way that it is interpreted uh, by the people that we're going to be talking about tonight. So you have to start out with some biblical history background of what went on b before. Uh, television multi-part series do that in that first four minutes. So let me do that in the first four minutes. So we should start with Leah's history, except Leah has no history. She has a genealogy, but she has no history. Um, but if I go on, this will turn into a feminist lecture, which I feel capable of giving because I'm sort of incensed by that. But I think it's an important thing to keep in mind that, and you'll, you'll excuse me, Barry, by, <clears throat> by talking about the rabbis, uh, plural, but certainly the classic rabbinic commentators had their own locus of origin for their commentaries. It was often colored by things that maybe we forget they were shaping their commentaries with or being shaped by. And so the rabbis who interpreted these texts, they were concerned, number one, they were concerned with, with their congregants, with, their, with the contemporary Jews of the time who were often living terrible lives. And so one of the things they wanted to do was to give an uplifting message that good will triumph, that the weak will become strong, and so forth. So that's a, a kind of a bias. If they, could, if they could write their commentaries to fit that worldview, that was really good. Um, and, and may not have even been intentional, but it's there. And there are other biases. They were certainly trapped in the biases of their time. So they were certainly trapped in a patriarchal uh, attitude, by and large. There are wonderful exceptions, but, uh, but they, they were trapped th there. So that I think that's 
why Leah has no background. Um, so we should, um, we, we have to go to Leah's husband if we want history. And that's Jacob. He has a history, a detailed history. Leah just will soon appear on the scene. Jacob's history starts in the womb. So um, in particular, Jacob's big struggle with his uh, twin, his older twin, Esau. And there are a few incidents in his life um, that are recounted. The one that's critically important is the incident in which Jacob, at the urging of his mother, Rebekah, uh, appears before his father, Isaac, to get the blessing reserved for the firstborn son, the older son, which Jacob wasn't. And Isaac, by that time, is blind. And Jacob gets away with it. So he walks out of that tent of blessing with the firstborn blessing. Uh, his brother Esau is enraged, and uh, Jacob gets sent to his mother's hometown, Haran, in Mesopotamia, to number one, to get away from his brother, but number two, to find an appropriate wife. An appropriate wife in those days would be um, a, a relative uh, so that you know her background and so forth. So that is how Jacob comes from Canaan to Haran. That's how Jacob starts uh, looking for a wife. He doesn't look very long. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, the first person that the Torah tells us he sees uh, it, the first eligible female is not Leah, is Leah's younger sister, Rachel. And Jacob falls in love with her, perhaps instantly. Uh, some of the rabbis uh, call this the first romantic meeting in the Bible. And then Leah, uh, in, then Leah has her wedding night, which we'll talk about, and goes on, when we won't be able to cover that, in, uh, in a lifetime of struggle, of rivalry with her co-wife, uh, Rachel, who also marries Jacob. There's a competition for children that Leah wins handily, but that doesn't mean that she won what she was after, and we'll go into that. So. The reason why Jacob's history is important to understand Leah's life situation with Jacob is that Jacob's history in the religious attitude of the measure for measure uh, philosophy of the book and of the interpreters, uh, that, that history really determines what the future is going to be. And that future really reflects what that history has been. So keep in mind the taking of the blessing from the blind father, Isaac. Now, if you will, let's, um, let's turn to the study sheet. The, as I say, appropriately colored lavender sheet. Uh, I thought I would start with something sort of uh, basic, not involved so much with people, but just a general, a kind of introductory uh, study point that would be an introductory uh, paragraph in any narrative. Uh, so uh, at the top, uh, section one, where I'd love to start this with, uh, with uh, Leah being introduced, but Leah's not on the scene, at least not directly. Um, 
So th this is just the English translation. So Jacob has just arrived and he's talking to the shepherds that he sees with their flock around the well. And he says, uh, well, water the sheep and go ahead and feed them. And, the sh and these shepherds answer, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and until they roll the stone from the well's mouth and then we will water the sheep. And while he still, he, Jacob still spoke with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep for she kept them. All right, a surface reading of that is, that's just setting the scene. There's no, I mean, they're not trying to get to anything, right? They're just kind of, okay, here's what happens. This is the beginning. But uh, think about this. What do you think, if you read it closely, if you read every word, and if you think about the situation, what does this tell you about what's going on in Haran at the time? Yes? That there's a drought, there's a water shortage. And, and, and how do we know that from the text? Yes, there's a big, they say there's a big stone and we can't move it until, until everybody gets together. That's a perfect primitive way of rationing a scarce resource so that nobody individually when nobody's looking can take more than their share. And, um, and what, and what are some of the consequences of that? What do we know about Laban, the father? It just says her father's sheep, but we'll learn later that the father's name is Laban. And by the way, the, it is probable that these stories came from an oral tradition. Oral traditions are repeated, right? If there is one parent in this room who has only read Good Night Moon once, raise your hand. Okay, it just doesn't happen. Oral traditions are repeated and repeated and repeated. And so, so these stories are for people who know the beginning, who know the end, who know what came before, and who know what's coming afterwards. So it is totally valid to, I think, to uh, approach this from that point of view, from saying, okay, what, what happens later that makes this, what do we learn later that makes this understandable? So what, what, if anything, do we know about Laban, who's just mentioned as the person who has the flock? Does anybody have any sense of, of any Laban suggestions, any father suggestions here? Yes. Okay, well, or, so the answer was, the answer given, and by the way, you can relax because there are no right answers here. So all the answers are great. Uh, but the answer there is that, that this sort of suggests that he doesn't have sons at the time, that he just has, now we only know of one daughter, but we'll soon learn there are two. Uh, he just has the two daughters. And, th and that certainly is one a part of the information. Um, he not only has two daughters, but, but who's taking charge of the flock? The younger one. Now we don't know yet how younger uh, or how young she is, uh, but we do know that, that his younger daughter is in charge of the flock. So this says something about the flock. What do you think happened to the flock? This, this is a consequence of the drought that we just heard of. His flock, like everybody else's, has been decimated. There's great poverty and struggle in, in, in the land. And we learn all of that just from thinking about this young girl handling her father's entire flock. Uh, and one character is totally, totally absent in in this introductory phrase, which is uh, Leah. But the rabbis even use this text, a text in which Leah doesn't appear to talk about Leah in, in the rabbis' deep reading commentaries. And, and the reason is, um, 
Well, maybe that's what they're supposed to do, or maybe when you have a character who is simply not represented in the text, you have to dig deep in other characters' text to try and say something about her. So does this text, just so far that we've read, suggest anything about Leah? We know you're allowed to use your information that she's the older sister. Not yet. It does not say she's the older sister yet. But again, th these stories are for people who presumably are not hearing it for the first time. Yes? All right, so, so the answer was that, that in the later text, not only do we find out that she is the older of the two girls, but we also find out that she it describes her, her one word of physical description is that she had, unfortunately it's a word that's very hard to translate, rakot eyes, and very often, You'll see in the translation that that's taken to mean weak eyes, weak eyes. So eyes that that are troubled, that that have that have vision problems, that that aren't uh, either don't look good or don't operate well. And if you take weak eyes to mean malfunctioning or or, or eyes that aren't up to the task of seeing uh, so well, then you certainly say, okay, that's why. Leia is not out there with her. And that certainly is one of the possibilities. Um, and, and, and there are other possibilities that come into this. Uh, what I'd like to cite this exercise for so far is that here's a text that doesn't even talk about Leia, and yet we can start thinking about Leia because we know that she's a character, we know that she's coming along in, to be introduced, and we know that she's the older sister who you would think naturally would, would, um, would be uh, a person at least helping in this enterprise. And so the connection with what little we know about her physically, that is that she had these eyes, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, is something. All right. Um, let's... Uh, let's go on to the first romantic meeting in the Torah. Unfortunately for Leah, she's not present. So it's not her romantic meeting. Uh, it is, uh, Rachel has just come to the well, there's some other business, but let's skip to uh, part two, which is uh, Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice or cried out, or cried and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Okay. So, what are some questions even uh, in this text? Okay, somebody is questioning her, uh, her, how can he be her father's brother um, be, because, uh, because he is the son of Rebecca and Rebecca was her father's sister. So Rebecca and Laban are brother and sister and uh, Rachel and Leah are the children of Laban and Jacob and Esau are the children of Rebecca. So they're clearly cousins. They, they, they are not, uh, the, the children are, are not uh, uh, uncle and niece. And um, so, so what do you do? I mean, if, if, if you believe that this is great literature, you have some explaining to do. If you believe that this is, that this is a holy writ, you have some explaining to do. It just says that. So what are some explanations? Yes? Okay, that's, that's good. So the one answer is watch out for translation. By the way, we, most of us in this room, probably know 
Torah through reading translation, which is, thank goodness, there is translation, because otherwise I wouldn't be young enough to finish the Torah. But, uh, because I did drop out of Hebrew high school, but uh, you should understand that translation sounds, that sounds like what certified people in the court do when somebody comes and doesn't speak English. They translate and then we can go ahead and have the whole trial based on what the translator says the person testifying said. That's a nice fiction in itself, but, but you should understand that translation is commentary. Translation is interpretation. You can't get away from it. And this is one of those cases. So one of the alternative sources to the Hebrew Bible are some of the translations made very long ago. Uh, one group of those are called, uh, are called targums, and, and a targum is an Aramaic translation at a time when um, Jews spoke, lived in lands where, they're, where they spoke Aramaic. And so the most famous of those is Ankylos, uh, and, and he translates this issue away. He, he uses just the idea that was, that was said in the response, and that is, um, brother doesn't mean brother. You know, if, if somebody says to me, thank you, my brother, you've been very kind, uh, I don't think he's claiming uh, brotherhood in the technical sense. He just means you're recognizing that we are related in the family of man, or or at least kinship, or something like that. So that is one way of translating that away. Um, and the rabbis, interestingly, pick a totally different way to deal with it. They say, what's he saying? He's saying, brother, why would he say that? And the rabbis say, well, there's another sense of the word brother. By the way, the rabbis know where they want to go with this, so they obviously use the, the words that they will get them to the point they want to make. And they say, he is saying, and it's a very interesting passage, and, and I, we don't have time to go into it, but they say, he is saying, he is her father's brother, meaning equal. And why is he saying that? Because the rabbis invent an entire new section that doesn't appear at all in the Torah. But in their commentary, they say, oh, you want to know what happened? Here's what happened. You don't have a kiss and tears and then goodbye. If these people are acting like lovers, they had a lover's conversation and the rabbis proceed to describe the entire con uh, conversation. And one of the things that they do is they say, oh, Rachel says, okay, um, I just want you to know my father is quite a piece of work and he will do anything to marry off my older sister before he marries me off. And so you should be ready for anything, because he'll even do trickery. Whereupon Jacob says, oh, don't worry. I'm your father's brother when it comes to trickery. This is an astounding thing for a patriarch to say. Now, he doesn't say it in the text, but the word brother is all that the rabbis need to go into that and to create their idea of what the Bible should have said if they would have only asked the rabbis. <laughs> so, uh, so, that's, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that, 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 the, uh, the other thing that the rabbis spend a ton of time on is the kiss. I love it because uh, times change, but people don't. And we're all still curious. Uh, kiss, okay, what kind of kiss is it? No cell phones, so no quick pictures. So we have only the text. And the text doesn't say anything. It, 
By the way, what is entirely missing from this lover's exchange is Rachel, the recipient of the kiss, the cause of the tears. What's in her mind? What does she think? Well, the rabbis, of course, invent the private conversation. But we also have to think about her because uh, although she gets a little better press than her uh, older sister, uh, Rachel too doesn't get a whole lot uh, in the Torah. Um, okay, did you have a question? Well, I was, I was thinking about the image that was, that's being created here. And so Jacob gets to this well. There were a bunch of other shepherds there. He's wondering, okay, aren't we going to do our thing? And they say, no, 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 not yet. We have to wait for Rachel and Laban's flock. So obviously Laban's a big guy in town because they can't open the well until his flock appears. Then he sees Rachel and it looks like he, you know, it looks like he's just taken away by her. Um, they've not been introduced. He goes up to this woman who, who um, is, is not introduced to him. He kisses her, um, raises his voice, and starts to weep. Now, it sounds like this guy's been in the desert way too long. <laughs> and he's been smitten by this woman. And then he reacts in a way that doesn't sound like it's really socially appropriate. And so he may have been saying, no, no, no. Before anybody comes to defend her honor and beat me up, I'm her father's brother. I'm family. It's, it's okay. This is not as inappropriate as it might seem. And so, you know, when he made that comment, I wondered if he was trying to save face for something that may not have been a socially appropriate thing to do. Well, uh, this is a good point. Um, I hope you all heard that. Do I, any, okay, good. Um, so, so the question is whether whether his tears have anything and his declaration of brotherhood or kinship have anything to do with uh, something that he perhaps fears is going to be taken inappropriately by everybody around. First of all, I'm not so sure it's inappropriately taken. It may have been an inappropriate thing, and the rabbis talk about that. Um, you used uh, the very diplomatic phrase that he's been in the desert too long. But one of the things the rabbis love to do, they love to, and this was before digital calculators, they love to, to figure out ages and lifespans and when things were happening and, and stuff from the slimmest of clues and the strangest of hypotheses. Um, so I won't go into the calculations, but I will say that according to the majority of the rabbis, we know exactly how old this lover Jacob was when he finally meets his, his uh, beloved. And he, it's a very uncomfortable number for me to admit to because I share it with him, he was 77. Okay, in a way, that's sort of complimentary. I, I don't mind that, but, but it is not only the medieval rabbis or the earlier sages who give Torah commentary and interpretation. It continues down to today. Uh, that's a good question. The question of how old is Rachel, and we'll get to that in just a minute. So, so what I want to say is that contemporary uh, interpreters, especially those who read Torah as literature, Robert Alter is um, perhaps the sort of founder of, of that movement uh, of literary interpretation of the Bible. And he says, well, of course he grabbed her and kissed her or whatever, and it was pent up lust or sexual drive or energy. And, uh, and that's a contemporary comment. But what to me is interesting is you don't have to talk about recent writers to get a contemporary comment. Because one of the commentators, 13th century, 13th century, who hadn't had much of a chance to read Sigmund Freud yet, said, ah, Rachel is the niece of Rebecca, Jacob's mother. He comes from a harrowing, life-threatening uh, experience in, in his journey, and he sees somebody who resembles his mother. And that's why he cried. 
cried out of relief, joy, whatever you want to call it. But that's really interesting, especially interesting if you go back and read more about Jacob. The text about Jacob suggests he was not only his mother's favorite, but he might have been kind of what we call a mama's boy. Uh, his, his older twin brother Esau is out slaughtering uh, unknowing animals, and Jacob stays in the tents. You can call it the tent of study, you can call it the women's tents, but whatever it is, he is, he is not, he is not the, the, the fullback on the team. Uh, 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 the rabbis talk about whether this is, um, uh, whether this has to be driven by romantic or sexual uh, urges. And many of the rabbis say what Jacob forgot was only that nobody, your point, uh, what Jacob forgot is that nobody knew that he, that he was related and that this was a kiss of kinship, which was quite permissible. Uh, and they even talk about, I mean, you've got the rabbis who say it was on the forehead and the rabbis who say it was on the shoulder. Um, so it gets very detailed. By the way, the rabbis were not unaware that they're talking about matriarchs and patriarchs. And their idea is not to have nobody come next Shabbat. So they didn't want to break the, the, the uh, heroic image of these illustrious forebears. And so many of them kind of tailored their comments to find the one reasonable way you could say, yes, um, th this was okay. This was a action appropriate to a matriarch or a patriarch. Yes? Yes, I'm sorry. So, so I, I, uh, the beginning of the book has a chart. Uh, actually, we're all friends here, so I can be a little confessional. Um, the book has been out for, uh, for uh, uh, two months, almost, and, and I can tell you that it is not without warm compliments. That's the good thing. The bad thing is some of my best friends have complimented me on two things. One of them is the cover, <laughs> and, the, uh, and the other is the one chart diagram in the book, which is the genealogical chart, and they say, oh, thank goodness you did that. I could never keep all these guys straight. <laughs> so whether they've read anything other than the cover and the chart, I... I don't know, but they all say they love the book. Okay, uh, you asked about the age of Rachel, and, and that's a problem because the same rabbis who calculate the age for Jacob aren't necessarily the rabbis who decide they can calculate the age for Rachel. And so you have different people who don't feel like they have to be consistent necessarily. Uh, plus, let's remember all the numbers in the Torah are strange numbers. They, the, the, the lifespans, the ages, the, the you name it, uh, whatever is a number uh, is very often a symbolic number that carries a different kind of meaning than the actual calculator kind of number. So the, the, I think the consensus, uh, if you want my uh, conclusion based on what I've read, the consensus is that Rachel and um, Leah were very close in age, if not identical, and that um, identical, by the way, is the way I, you know, I always judge the Torah by, well, how would I have written that? And I know what I would have done if I were a novelist. I would say, okay, we've got this twin who's had nothing but trouble with his twin brother, and uh, who should he meet? But wouldn't it be great if he met a twin who's going to have nothing but trouble with her twin sister? It just is just, that's too good not to be true, right? So, so some people say that they were twins, and that is really a great dramatic uh, effect. 
Um, others say no. Uh, Rachel was markedly younger. Uh, one rabbi who was, I think, looking in the wrong direction uh, said uh, he thought maybe Rachel was five, which explains why Jacob agreed to work for seven years before he married Rachel, because then she would be marriageable. That's great, except unlike Leah, who gets described with rachot eyes, uh, we know what is said about Rachel, that she is beautiful of face and has a shapely figure. So that's not five. No, 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 she did not. Actually, there is a stone-moving story which I, which I did not focus on because I was working hard not to make this the book of Jacob. So, so uh, she, did, she did not, uh, there's nothing to, to suggest that she did it. It was actually Jacob. Yes. She could not. That's what, I mean, based on my limited experience. She could not. And so, um, and so I'm saying that, rab, that uh, medieval interpreter was just looking in the wrong direction. He, he thought, oh, here's a great way to work those numbers, because I never could understand seven. But seven and five is 12, and in the desert, 12 is like ready for the wedding. So OK, let's move on to the ultimate, to the, um, to the introduction of Leah, and then we, I promise we'll get to the wedding night. So Leah is introduced finally, and uh, here is, the, this is uh, section three, and here is Laban had two daughters, the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had, my translation for the word rechot is tender, and I'll, I want to talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, Leah had tender, this is 18 years of advanced Jewish study and I translate one word. Okay. Um, Leah had tender eyes, but Rachel was beautiful of form and beautiful of appearance. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Okay. There's too much here to talk about, so I want to uh, so that we don't miss out on the wedding night, I want to just talk about my word tender. Tender eyes, not weak eyes, but tender eyes. And, and let me explain why, and then, yes. Um, because the word tender eyes is exactly like rechot eyes. You don't know what it means without the context. If I tell you, I'm very sorry to be addressing you tonight wearing sunglasses, but I have tender eyes. Everybody knows that's the weak eyes that were uh, discussed before. But if I tell you, oh, yes, it, it's been a long time since I courted my wife, but I will never forget her tender eyes. Well, I'm not talking about the fact that she can't read or see. I'm talking about the kind of softness, uh, uh, beautiful, etc. So tender can be either one of those. And uh, if you take a translation and put it in the book, you can't use both unless you use the similarly ambiguous word. That's why I picked tender. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, the, the, uh, the woman who, who raised the point that she had weak eyes, that, that, that the majority of the interpretations are weak eyes. And do you know why? I think it's because it makes a great story. It makes a great story because, because the rabbis say, and it's also in the book at length, uh, the rabbis say, so why were her eyes weak? And so they come up with a story. And the story is one of the stories that establishes the beginnings of Leah's ethical moral superiority, which is the theme that I read out of much of this. Yes, did you have a comment? Now, when she was destined to marry um, Rabbi learned that she was destined to marry Asa, and um, she cried and cried, and 
Right, that's the, that's the story that I'm talking about. The rabbis take the story, they take, take the weak eyes, and they say, why would she have weak eyes? It's actually more beautiful in the original because, uh, the, the, because it's a dialogue between a rabbi and his disciple. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and, and the rabbi says, so uh, uh, what, are, what are rechot eyes? And, and, uh, and the, and the uh, disciple says, well, that's important because it's saying that, that uh, Leah's eyes were weak. And th this is in formal Midrash. And the rabbi says, well, your mother's eyes were weak, but why were Leah's eyes weak? Meaning, why in this story do we have a character with weak eyes? And what could that mean? So what you're saying, which is that uh, they were, the rabbis attribute her weak eyes to tears, that, that she cried a lot, and that was because she was fearful of marrying if Rachel gets Jacob, who's left for these twin twins? It would be Leah and Esau. Esau is not a nice person, and uh, Laban is not a nice person, by the way, and Shechem later is not a nice person. So, the, so, uh, so Leah is showing moral sensitivity, ethical sensitivity, to be that distressed uh, about, about that potential marriage. Okay. Um, Let's turn now to, um, to the wedding night and then the morning after. We'll do this very quickly. So the wedding night is number four. And, and it says, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him to Jacob, and he, Jacob, went into her. Okay, so this is, this is the part where I ask younger children to please leave their cookies in the back. <laughs> um, so, so what is this? Um, I mean, this, this is just reciting something. Uh, is there more here? What could, what could come out of deep reading this particular passage, because it's obviously a very important one. Anybody have any response, any ideas about, about clues? If you, were, if you had that big magnifying glass and you were reading the text word for word, what would catch your eye? What phrase? One possibility is that why does it say he took Leah, his daughter? Uh, I mean, the girl practically doesn't get mentioned, and the one time she is mentioned, it's saying Laban had two daughters. So we already know that. But the Bible doesn't toss around extra words. If you approach it as traditionally religious, it's because it's a divine book. If you approach it as great literature, it's because it's great literature. So whatever it is, read it as if every word is there. And if words are repeated, if they are duplicated, if the same thing is described in two different words, what are the two different meanings or flavors that are being given? So, so because it says Leah, his daughter, this suggests a whole defense of Leah. Imagine if you, if, if you were arguing the case. Uh, imagine. Leah's doing, and we know Leah's doing something really wrong because, because, he, because she, is, um, uh, she is being, uh, she is being um, uh, passed off as, as Jacob's beloved, the one he expects to marry, the one he wants to marry, and the one he thinks he's marrying. That's pretty shocking. So should there be some blame on Leah? And if so, where can we get some defense? And the answer is his daughter. She's an obedient daughter. This is filial obligation. And it's wonderful because the rabbis can quote their favorite source, the rabbis, who also commented in the earlier section on Jacob Passing himself off as his, passing himself off, interesting. He, what's happening to him is what he did to his brother. Uh, so, so 
In that situation, the rabbis go to great detail to say Jacob was an unwilling participant in stealing the blessing. Unwilling. I didn't go into great length in the book because, I, again, I wanted this. Leah has so little that I wanted this to be her book. I didn't want this to be a Leah and Jacob story. So, but, I, but, but I'm telling you that, that the rabbis say Jacob was unwilling. And here's what happened. Rebecca, according to the rabbis, she basically threatened him. She said, listen, you do this. It'll be my responsibility. I'll manage it. You just do it. And you know what? That didn't work. The rabbis go on to say what happened in that tent is not some slick con man who comes in to a blind father and, and says, I'm, I'm my older brother. What happens is that Jacob is so petrified and ashamed at what his mother is making him do that his knees buckle. And according to the rabbis, God had to send two angels to prop him up and move him forward like some mannequin. So, so obviously they're trying to rehabilitate Jacob in that interpretation. But what's interesting is that it's the same aspect, filial obligation, that they now seize upon to start, uh, uh, or continue rather, Leah on her journey to moral excellence. So in terms of what you said before about reward and punishment, mm -hmm. Oh, no. So the question is, is this a case of measure for measure uh, divine justice? It very much is. It very much is because although the rabbis understand that Jacob, or believe that Jacob was not the initiator of this, that he, was, he, he went along because his mother uh, told him to do so, etc., he still, I mean, he's a grown person. He has a responsibility. He has an obligation. He said those words. And so it's not ventriloquism. So I think that the rabbis very much now, as I do, say, wait a minute. Uh, this wedding took place in darkness. The, tent was in, the wedding tent was in darkness. And the tent of blessing was in darkness. That is, Isaac was blind. And, and you've got the, the, brother, the two brothers reversing older and younger, and passing oneself off as the other, etc. So it's very much measure for measure. Mita connected mita is the, is the rabbinic term. Yes? What do you mean? Ah, okay. So the, that's, a, that's a great question. Because the question is, uh, what about the language that suggests th that he that Laban took Leah his daughter? So what does that mean? And in fact, what the rabbis go on is what I sort of was trying to hint at before, because the next phrase is and brought her to him. So the rabbis say, well, there are two there are two verbs here. They've got to mean something different because because there have to be different aspects of what's going on. So one of them might be that he arranged it, and the other was that he physically pushed her, that he physically dragged her into the tent. That's wonderful because you have two characters, and rabbis are already certain who's good and who's bad. They already know that Leah is, in their minds, good. She is or will develop into moral superiority, and they already know that Laban is one of the really bad guys. He is Jacob's foil, antagonist. So it's a great literary device in just this very compact sentence to do both things, to exonerate Leah, partially at least, and to blame Laban. OK, um, and now we get to the question and answer about what I promised, which is what really happened on Leah's wedding night. And, and I think a very significant thing, uh, item five, which I titled the morning after, because that's what happens right after the wedding night, 
what happens, and, and by the way, I'm not going into the wedding night story. It happens to be the best story in the book. So you're crazy if you think I'm going to tell you about it. <laughs> read the book. Or as Barry would say, buy the book. I don't care if you read it. All right. Here comes the morning after, because this is a truth that's actually more important than the salacious details, which the rabbis supply, by the way, uh, the salacious details of what went on in that wedding tent of Jacob believing that his bride was Rachel. Uh, and it's very brief, and it says, Vayihi um, b'boker v'hinehi leah. And, and uh, it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. This sentence is really powerful. If you think it's just a narrative to take you from the night to the morning, you're missing so much. This sentence, number one, I think, the phrasing of this sentence makes it clear that Jacob went through that evening, whatever you think happened, or whatever the rabbis think happened, went through that evening believing he was cohabiting with his wife, Rachel. This can't be faked. This isn't, this isn't somebody else's observation. This is the omniscient narrator. And, and so, so this is an experience being described. And what, to me, sums up the Midrashic process of rabbinic deep reading is that the question for this event I got when I was starting out my studies from Rashi, who's 11th century. And Rashi looks at this sentence and he doesn't say what happens. He asks a question. He's a good Jewish rabbi. He asks questions. And he says, hmm, and it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And so Rashi says, so at night she wasn't Leah? What could this mean, he asks. But he doesn't exactly answer it. I mean, he gives an answer. But his answer isn't as important as his question. And his question is important, for me at least, because it was answered beautifully a thousand years later. Aviva Zornberg, who is spoken here, I understand. Aviva Zornberg, who also comes to California, and I've heard her uh, several times, she answers Rashi's question. He says, well, if it's a big surprise that in the morning she was Leah, who was she at night? She wasn't Leah at night? And Aviva Zornberg says, that's right. She was not Leah at night. Who was she? At night, she knew what it was to be the beloved wife of the man she loved, Jacob. For that one night before he found out it was Leah, she knew that. She felt it. She was that person. I'm not just talking about that he was fooled. It was what she felt like being the recipient of affection from a husband who frankly goes on to be not very affectionate towards her. And what's interesting is that Zornberg goes on to say, and look at, the, look at the parallel. What happened in the tent of blessing with blind Isaac? The answer is, everybody is troubled by the language where Jacob says to his father, his father kind of suspects something, it's peculiar, and he says, who, who are you? Are you my son? Who? And, and Jacob finally says, I am your son, Esau. That's a pretty tough thing for a patriarch to be pinned with. But Zornberg says, in a way, that was true. Jacob, who was always his mother's favorite, Never his father's favorite. Esau was his father's favorite. Jacob finally learned in the tent of blessing what it's like to be the older brother, what it's like to be the loved son. So even though it was instantaneous, just one moment in his life, that was really important. He got to feel that, and maybe he went on to change in a way that he could 
recreate that feeling of importance. So uh, I, I think it's been it's been mentioned in the introduction that um, that Leia is the mother of us all because uh, because there are only two there are only two tribes identifiably remaining, and that is Judah. That's why we're Judahites. Uh, but one other tribe, uh, the, the, I happen to be a Kohen, so it's the, it's the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, some part of which was also in the southern kingdom when the ten northern tribes were taken away. So, uh, so that's important. And lots of other important things happened to Leah, not just the the genealogy of the Jewish people, I'll call in just one moment, uh, the genealogy of the Jewish people is one thing, but there's also something quite important that, that when you read the story, you'll see how Leah, who's not in general beloved by her father, not in general beloved by her husband, and none of her kids call, <laughs> I mean, it's, nothing's changed about that. Um, she's ignored by her children, and perhaps with good reason, uh, as I discuss in the book. But the point is she has one supporter, one, and that one is God. I think, I think that Leah becomes God's beloved. He intervenes for her in remarkable, indeed, it's not overstatement to say miraculous ways. And this book recounts that. Um, so, so, so we should remember that, that tracing Leah's increasing ethical development until it reaches a, an incredibly high point of self-sacrifice in the interest of doing right as opposed to doing what's best for herself we should we should know that that is um, something that that if you read this book as I suggest you should once in a while religiously as well as literature uh, she becomes God's beloved in this story and the indeed the only mystery that I know of in um, in in Leah's story that's not uh, able to be explained is why. Did we lose her? Why did we forget her? And I think it is because the Torah has always been elevated, appropriately so, so that the rabbinic analysis, which gives meaning, flesh to the bones of Torah, that uh, never got sufficiently absorbed by the Jewish people in general. And, uh, and Rachel, uh, somehow or other, uh, got, to be, got to be accepted as a popular heroine or matriarch. But I think the bottom line is that, I have to say, a fair reading of Torah is that Leah was technically a matriarch, period. But a deep reading of Torah is that Leah was also a, a great heroine of the Torah. You just have to read it that way with the help of the rabbis. So uh, thank you. I'm going to talk about your question later because we're running out of time now. I'm very sorry. But thank you for your attention. You know you're in the presence of a gifted teacher when you hear comments about such a familiar tale and you say to yourself, oh, yes, no, ah, aha. And I heard those reactions visibly tonight. So once again, let's thank our teacher. It's well worth it to purchase the book. David Ellenson, the immediate past president of Hebrew Union College, will be visiting in November. 
a dramatic rendition on its 75th anniversary of the epic novel, As a Driven Leaf in December. Hope to see you there. Thank you once again. Good night.